Hello and welcome to another episode of Newsreel with Joe and Neil. I'm Joe. I'm Neil. Today's Sunday, November 25th, and we're going to discuss this week populism. Among other things. Among other things. Um, populism. What is it? Whence it came? Where is it going? You may have heard about it. It's, yeah, it's obviously, you know, a discussion many people are having. It's been going on for a couple of years. Well, a lot longer than that, but in the last three years, obviously, since Trump and Brexit, um, we hear a lot about it. Um, it's interesting that it took those two events for so many people who previously maybe disregarded it to actually pay attention to the term and the phenomenon as they see it. Um, you're going to, you've obviously, you know, people have a lot of opinions about it and there are probably as many opinions as there are people. And so, you know, we're not going to try and actually lock down any kind of definition. What, what I would say is what they all seem to have in common, whether someone is looking at it as something that's just horrific and uh, threatening to destroy life as we know it, or from the opposite end of the spectrum as um, the thing that's here to save us all. Um, it seems that the common denominator is that the fundamental observation is that it begins with a worldview where there are masses of people and then there are elites. Mm -hmm. Now you might say, so what? But what, what's striking about those who are horrified by it so primarily in the see them in the mainstream media voices. Um, what strikes me is that when they're writing about it and telling us, informing us that what they've just realized apparently is that it's a, based on a worldview where there are basically masses of people and then elites and that there's a, some kind of rather fundamental difference between them is that this is new to them. They never. They appear to have never conceived of it this way before. It's, 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 it's strange, you know. For us and for our listeners, it's like, well, yeah, the sky is blue, yeah, because that's exactly how we've been framing and seeing and talking about all these topics, you know, about uh, world events since forever. <clears throat> of course, there are. It's self-evidently true. But it, what appears to be going on here, is a kind of a awakening in let's say the intelligentsia which probably incorporates the elites and a lot of ordinary people who tend to side with them maybe that there is such a division it seems to be a shocking novelty to them, that this is how yeah. that there are people out there who conceive the world in such a way so go back to 2011 you had Occupy Wall Street mm -hmm. we are the 99% against the 1%. So it's at least seven years old in its modern incarnation, no? Right. And certainly the Western media comment on that, on that widely, you know, the 99%. Right, right. So but that they was can't, not, they can't that was not claims to ignorance. That was not termed populism. But it obviously was by definition. And there's only right. a couple of def definitions of populism. It's not very well defined, but there's only a couple of definitions of populism, um, mainly. And it's like what you said already. It's one of them is uh, uh, the large mass of people being... Uh, in, in opposition to a smaller group, usually a smaller group of elite, usually rich elite people and the rest of the people against them. Or it's more generally defined as, um, in a general sense, that, that the engagement of, uh, of the population in political decision making. So there's one's, one's a kind of, um, one's a kind of more, historical, I suppose, um, definition that draws on on events from history, you know, where the ordinary people were rabble-roused to fight against a small elite, the rich elite, the politicians, whatever. And the other definition is, is a more, more general definition, more kind of... Um, um, a more political definition, let's say. Uh, in terms of actually defining what it is, just uh, objectively, let's say. But uh, that second definition of, uh, of <laughs> the popular engagement of the population in political decision-making is also... The On the face of it, that should be the good thing. That should be... What's well, the definition of democracy, no? Yeah. Uh, but, it's, but it's a negative because 
are, are they sub, are they sub indirectly telling people when they use a pejorative iteration of populism? Are they indirectly saying y'all aren't supposed to be involved in this? It's this is our of course. We'll, well, we'll tell you what to do. Well, yeah, it exposes the lie of of democracy effectively when people don't like populism. I mean, even in those two uh, definitions, whichever one you you pick, it's it's essentially the the mobilisation of ordinary people right. into into not directly into politics, but certainly giving them a more direct say in what happens uh, yep. in, in, in politically in political decision making. It's the tyranny of the masses, right? And it's it's also you can see how that would be associated with communism or com uh, Bolshevik revolution, that kind of stuff, where ordinary people rose up, you know, the pro proletariat rise up and overthrow the uh, overthrow the corrupt elite. That's populism, right? That's in its pejorative sense. And even you could say Hitler might be a bit, might have been a bit populist. So it has the connotation of whipping the people up, the ordinary people up and exploiting them even. That's why they, they, they haven't, certain people give it a negative connotation that it's exploiting the, the emotional fervor of the people and whipping it up. So for political, for the political aims of some other elite faction, you know, to just mm -hmm. simply take power. Let's say, like Hitler did. Yeah. Um, but on the face of it, it's it's um, it's. I mean, the definition of populism itself in the dictionary is just grassroots democracy, and democracy is government by the people. Although, so what's what's grassroots? Then grassroots is tends to suggest a more rural type uh, dweller. So maybe the the underclasses. So it, if you put it all together, it has this connotation of the underclasses or the lower classes rising up against a corrupt elite. And more specifically, b beginning to, in a lot of cases, the first time, beginning to participate in politics. Right. That the option that was always there for them to participate, well, they're now yeah. actively or, or increasingly doing so. Or more likely getting a leader who appears to pander to those people's interests directly, you know, and says, I'm going to serve your interests. Kind of like Trump does, right? I'm going to serve the working man and stuff. The problem with... Uh, the, un the idea of it just being the underclasses is that it's more popular these days because more and more people have become the lower or underclasses. Not, you know, in, in e e from an economic point of view, for sure, in terms of, uh, you know, reduction in, 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 in wages and, um, you know, kind of the destruction of the middle class and all that kind of stuff, but also um, in terms of people's psychology, in terms of their their resentment towards... Authority, people in authority are the, the ruling class today. So it's not just the historically the, the the lower classes had much more reason to rise up and protest in the streets and stuff because they were the first to suffer. But now more people are suffering in different ways up through the strata of the classes. So you have a rise in populism, which is this idea of more and more people getting angry at the elite. That's what populism eff effectively means: and ordinary people getting angry at the elite. And the horrified pearl clutching that takes place is either left unstated or it's explicitly stated. It depends on what context and how they use it. it in, by bringing up the two examples you just mentioned, namely Nazi Germany and the Soviet system. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's synonymous. the Bolshevik system, but anyway. Um, it's synonymous with mob rule, right? Mob rule. It, it, but there's something that they're overlooking here. Today, there's there's no one who is, an, a, in any way, a successful populist uh, leader or party or movement. Apart from Donald Trump, no, including him, that has not used the ballot. Right, but no, it's not. and then once in is not threatening to do away with democracy. No, no, but there's no there's no implication in the idea of populism that it's that it's anti democratic. It's actually fully democratic. It's always by democratic means. It's just a, it's the wrong demographic <laughs> that is uh, getting a lot of the a lot of attention or getting a lot of you know representation in, in politics you know right I, or the wrong demographic in the sense of or the demographic has gone wrong in general most of the voters they're doing something wrong i.e. they're no longer happy or willing to or content to invest supposedly invest their power or their will in their elected representatives because more and more of them have become disenchanted with their with their uh, elected representatives so it can lead to uh, and obviously 
democracy is not what they say it is, obviously. It's not really the will of the people. If it's only the will of the people uh, be exercised, you know, or, or, or the will of the people invested in their political rep rep representatives, as long as the people are happy or content for those political representatives to make all the decisions, as long as they're happy with those representatives. That's when democracy works. When they're no longer happy with those representatives, it's no longer democratic. Um, according to popular opinion, let's say, or the, the ruling class themselves, of course. This is not no longer democratic. When when the people turn on their elected representatives and say, we don't like you anymore, or when you have protests like you have today in, in France, or um, an, a general anti-establishment sentiment among the people, that's not democratic. Well, technically it is, of course, democratic. It's almost even more democracy, if you know what I mean. It's, 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 it's a more direct... Uh, uh, influence of the people on the the political processes and, and and politicians, but from the politicians' point of view, that's actually less democracy because it holds the threat of mob rule and some kind of a a turnover into uh, well, anarchy, some I kind suppose. of anarchy yeah. or or totalitarianism or something. The system being radically changed overnight by this mob who wants to exercise their democratic rights. Uh, with someone else, though, some some other, some radically different uh, group of individuals, because these ones that we have, you know, the existing establishment in, in different countries, more and more people are thinking they're no good, they're corrupt, we don't like them, get them out, they're evil, and that's no longer democratic. So it's <laughs> it's just stupid, you know, <laughs> things like ridiculous in a certain sense, you know, um, it's it's playing with words and toying with words in that in that sense. There's nothing. There's nothing fixed about democracy, if you know what I mean. It's it's democracy with strings attached, which I suppose people have recognised that it's an imperfect system. Not there is no perfect political system, right? Yeah, it's um, the, the way you just described it. It reminds me of the term managed democracy. Hmm. Now, managed democracy was explicitly formulated and articulated by the early Putin administrations in Russia. Hmm. Now, <laughs> so right there. In the political theory, on paper, that's exactly the same thing, West and East. Mm -hmm. And yet, Putin is up, held up as the example of where the terror, the horror of the rise of populism in the West mm. could end up if we don't do something about this now. Right. You could end up with a system where there's managed democracy, but that's exactly how we handle democracy. We manage it. Mm -hmm. So it's all totally meaningless, or there's a meaning behind the terms that are being used, there are things that are not being said or that people are not yet aware of that speaks to the real difference, whatever it is, mm -hmm. between, in this case, uh, an example of two forms of managed democracy. What is it that differentiates the two of them, you know? Um, case in point... Uh, good, the, leader, good leaders and bad leaders. Good leaders and bad leaders. Well, okay, where's the good and bad? And there, you, still, you still have this, so how do you decide which is which? Uh, the Atlantic, um, I mean, they, they well, do this all the time, but I found an article where, the, talking about NATO, um, and what are we going to do about this problem where we now have three NATO countries that are ruled by uh, populists. They didn't put that term in quote, that, that, in quote marks, that, that's what they meant. So, specifically, their problem was that Orban, Erdogan, and uh, the Polish Prime Minister, who's arguably not really the strong man in that country. It's the guy behind the scenes called Kaczynski. But anyway, those three countries, Poland, Hungary, and um, Turkey, seek to govern in a manner closer to that of Putin. So I'm like, okay, well, gets back to well, what does that mean? In what manner does Putin govern? It gets back to what, your question about good and bad leaders. What are good and bad leaders? A good leader is, from the people's point of view, is a leader that primarily focuses on uh, you know, America first, or the country first, or putting the interests of the people first. Um, and a bad leader is one who, tend, who doesn't, doesn't do that, either focuses on his own interests or the interests of other groups outside of the country, uh, but doesn't show, uh, doesn't speak in a way that conveys that, that sentiment of your interests first, the people's interests first, and doesn't take action to, to back that up. Uh, that's a bad leader, and people ultimately 
will turn on those leaders because you know you're you're the leader of this country. Mm-hmm. You're not the leader of another country. I mean, and and the taxes we pay to you should not be going to to elsewhere to other countries around the world <coughs> or other projects that don't primarily or first and foremost focus on our welfare. You know, we pay taxes for the infrastructure in our country. We don't pay taxes that you can give them to supporting the infrastructure of other countries, you know. Um, and yeah, and that obviously then leads directly into nationalism. It is nationalistic, obviously, to focus on yeah. your own country first, or what's, and nationalism, nationalism is a bad word. Uh, because con- So leaders that are populist, i.e., they appeal to what the ordinary people in that country want, and what the ordinary people in that country want is for the government to focus primarily, or first and foremost, on, on their them. Needs. And that is, by definition, then called nationalistic, because you're focused on your nation. Uh, all this, all these suggestions that it then you can throw in kind of like racism and xenophobia and all this kind of stuff is bullshit. That's not actually the case at all. People who focus on their own interests. I mean, does anybody listen to this show? Focus on their interests first. I mean, when you go to work and you uh, and you and you get your salary, um, do you do you primarily focus <coughs> on or use that salary to? To um, to reinforce your own interests, let's say. <clears throat> Obviously, you do. So expand that out to a country level. I mean, it's a natural thing for human beings to do, to take care of themselves first, uh, because to do otherwise is a really bad idea. Because people will start to feel like they're disenfranchised, and they're also and, and they're being uh, they're not being well looked after. Their, their standard of living is dropping. Uh, so this whole thing that we throw in just by saying because Hitler. It means it's racist. Nationalism is racist. There is also just because Hitler, because some single historical event is complete bunk, you know, because mm-hmm. nationalism exists on its own as a, a, a sentiment, a political kind of movement or ideology that has existed obviously throughout throughout history. And it doesn't mean that you hate other people or that you're racist or you want to go and invade other countries. It means that you're interested <coughs> interested in looking after your own interests first. So <coughs> that's what a good leader does. By definition, I mean it's not rocket science that a that that people in a country would support that kind of a leader over a different kind of a leader or a different kind of leadership. They would support leadership and say, "This is good leadership." The leadership that focuses on the ordinary people's interests, because ultimately they have, they have, they elected this leadership in theory. That's where the democracy part comes in, right? We elected you to do what? Well, to look after us. Mm-hmm. But it's bad, apparently, today. It's evil. And so there's a, there's a whole sentiment coming from somewhere, from some other establishment, some, I don't know, I mean, obviously, the term globalist comes in, you know, a globalist establishment that is the antithesis of nationalism. So a clique of transnational politicians or industrialists, or whatever you want to call it, do not like this idea of nationalism because it works against their, their interests where they see rather than seeing one country as their home that they should serve, the whole world is theirs. And maybe they want to own all of it, or own as much of it as possible. So nationalism is a problem for them. You know, yeah. they see the world as a small place. And, and justifiably so, because over the last, let's say, 70 years since World War II, um, so much of it has become structurally interlinked. Right. The supply chains for companies... Um, and not even just the large conglomerates that are, obviously don't see borders mm-hmm. and, and they, they move their, their revenues here so that it avoids taxes right. and, and, and all these things. And they make use of what the options are available to them. But even even a smaller, uh, more local levels down to smaller, medium businesses, mm. it's, it's the same thing. I mean, mm-hmm. people, people, it's not so black and white. People do want a degree of openness. Mm. Um, but in a nationalist but, society, small companies and small businesses would be able to trade with other countries, no problem. I mean, that's, you know, in the EU, for example, you can facilitate that kind of thing through trade deals and open borders and all that kind of stuff, free trade agreements and that kind of stuff. Just because you have a your own borders around your own country and your own national interest doesn't mean, obviously, part of your national interest is to do good deals with other, with other countries, you know, and to, to increase trade with other countries that, that's beneficial, ideally beneficial for everybody. But multinational companies and some of them some of the big companies in the world, big corporations, have, have make more money than than many smaller countries. So there, some of those corporations are by definition kind of like they have the clout, the financial clout of countries themselves, and they are obviously not nationalistic in the sense that, you know, 
they they don't have any they don't exist in any particular country. Certainly, they don't see themselves as being limited to one country. They don't have allegiance to any one country necessarily because they want to spread their influence all around the world. Uh, corporations they want to have they want to have headquarters in as many countries in the world. But then that that obviously breaks down the idea of nationalism or serving one country first. Because how can a corporation decide which country it's going to show allegiance to if it's got headquarters in half the countries in the world? You know. So that's the problem of, of, of globalism and stuff. But yeah, um, Steve Bannon is going around um, still on a lecture tour. Recently, he was in, uh, gave a speech at Oxford University mm. Students Union. He wore a top hat to protest. To protest. I think I'm it, it, surprised they let him because <clears throat> it, a number of his other speaking arrangements were cancelled. Um, but in, in some cases, he's successful. He spoke in Oxford. Um, I listened to a part of it. Um, it talks about three extinction le- level events. Extinction. Extinction. Extinction level events. The the first one, he puts down to China, which I'll get back to in a minute, because he puts that first in time as around 2000, 2001. Um, but the next one was the one people can all agree on, the 2008 financial crash. So he means economic extinction? By, one, by extinction level event? I think it's ELEs, it's, it's extinction level. Like, like these are serious crises that right. we need to do something about or, or as he calls it, the Judeo-Christian world is, is done. Okay. We're like... Extinction of the West. We're doomed if we do not acknowledge these things happened and work to uh-huh. do something about them. That's, that's, that's his opening premise for, for why he's doing what he's doing. Right. So there's a financial crash of 2008 Um. The second one he gives is the enormous waste on Middle East wars. Mm. You remember Trump was doing that too when he was campaigning. It's, mm-hmm. it's, he finally gave a figure of $7 trillion on Iraq mm. and Afghanistan, Pakistan. Um, and then lastly, he talked about the one which actually comes first in his chronology. He talks about at the turn of the century, decisions were made to advance a process that had already been long underway. The rapid and increasing offshoring of American jobs to China and maybe the Pacific, East Pacific uh, more generally because um, all the jobs were going there because they were so cheap, um, the labor was so cheap. Um, I, I, this is where I went, what is he talking about? Because he just, he went out of his way to describe China as a totalitarian emphasis on totalitarian regime implementing East India Company predatory capitalism on whole swathes of the planet. And that is that is his he's spoken in, in more detail about this elsewhere. He tried to really hammer this home for Trump's administration's foreign policy, mm. which would be that China's one belt, one road it's investing of the surplus capital it's gotten over these decades of doing all this slave labor for other, to feed the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. It's China's premise of investing it in building up and lifting up out of poverty one billion Africans, another billion Asians, is, quote, synonymous with the implementation of East India Company's style predatory capitalism, i.e. they want to supplant us and do what we did, so mm-hmm. we're going to stop them. Mm-hmm. And it's a weird shtick to have in this whole debate because everything else he talked about is how I'm an economic nationalist. I'm just uh, an ordinary working boy from Virginia. I'm, it's the elites versus us. The elites screwed us over. He made mm. a movie about the mm. 2008 financial crisis. I mean, you know, it's, there's no holes barred. He could have been up there with Occupy Wall Street. Mm-hmm. The, you know, over the left, he's saying the bankers, they bail themselves out and the political class, they held a gun to our head and now we want justice. No justice, no peace. I mean, that's right. Steve Bannon, right. totally. And yet, but that's going left, in there. That's lefty, no? Extreme. And he, he says <laughs> in a number Mr. of times, <laughs> on a number of occasions in his Oxford Union speech, and then the question and answer after, he says, listen, I'm more progressive than most people in this room. Yeah. And he's true. By what he's saying and claiming, hmm. he is absolutely, you would put that hard left. Um, yeah, he's there with Occupy Wall Street. And yet, he talks rapidly. He's quite like Trump, actually, the way he, 
he won't quite finish a point mm -hmm. where he's off free associating into the next and the next. And one jump was seamless, but it made no sense in whatever point he was making because he got lost. But he jumps to, I remember, what, I was in the Navy. I was in the South China Sea. Blah, blah, blah. China evil, China evil. I was like, what are you saying? Between the lines, what I'm getting from you is we need to be there to stop China. Mm -hmm. China, China, China. But dude, where does that fit with let's sort our own house out first, economic nationalism, if you're saying we need to be spending more here in this particular part of the world to save it. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, a, there's a cognitive dissonance going on mm -hmm. there, at least it's represented through that one person. I mean, yeah. Bannon's will won't, you know, be the be-all and end-all, but he's one to watch because he's, he's going around Europe meeting with opposition parties, populist parties, or now leaders like Salvini or Orban, mm -hmm. trying to create some kind of a unified movement. It's called the movement. Um, he's spoken elsewhere in the summer about how George Soros is evil or something, mm -hmm. but he's, he's bloody awesome. I want to be like, I want to be like him, but we need to do as he did and come up with 32 billions to invest in a counter movement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, though, what are you doing sorting out people's houses in Europe if you're like telling them all, you all got to be nationalist and protect your nation state? Well, I think, I think you, a lot of them... Shouldn't you, you be doing that at home? What well, are you doing yeah, over here? It's, prob it's a problem for Americans because especially, you know, the American political class and, you know, educated in the Ivy League colleges or whatever who are... All, oh, no, but he's well, an ordinary working well, boy. Well, but otherwise informed, let's say. He's not, he's not an ordinary working boy. He might claim to be an ordinary working boy, but you don't start a, a news corporation and stuff like that if you're an ordinary working boy necessarily, except as part of the American dream, obviously, where anybody can be president, right? Mm -hmm. um, but Americans in general, Americans who are educated Americans like that and who have, a, have an inclination to, to involve themselves in... Other people's business. Well... They have an inclination to do that, basically, because they're Americans. Well, the ones that, ha that are interested in world politics and inform themselves and read up and write about world politics, uh, they're, by definition, like the bedrock of those people's psyche is manifest destiny, because we're American. To bring the light of to torture freedom to the four corners. Absolutely. Yeah. They, they don't ever expect any American, regardless if it is left, right, center, whatever, to ever n be able to not approach anything uh, to do with the rest of the world except from that perspective it's it's part of their dna at this point okay okay well, we'll put that in brackets and put it aside on the shelf what i found interesting was that um bannon's identification of those two two things in particular the great recession you know that's actually called the great recession now. yeah scotty's always conquering he's american he's always conquering uh you know territory in the office and stuff i mean uh it's hard to it's hard to stop him, you know. I, I seen that. I see the look in his eye, and it's just like I know he wants my stuff. Like, <laughs> no, no, okay. He wants oh, to make it better for you. <laughs> yeah, not to spread freedom and democracy. I, I just want to make it great again. Uh, okay, well that's okay. And that, it, since you put it that way, all right then. Uh, no, go ahead, Neil. <laughs> um. Well, okay, so putting that aside then, um, the the Guardian this week announced. The, a six-month campaign, basically a themed set of articles and analyses and stories and some videos already about populism. Mm -hmm. Now, you can imagine the angle they're going to go with. The Guardian itself identifies as, you know, liberal, left liberal. So populism is its enemy, ideologically. So, of course, imagine the flavor of things it's going to come out with. But it's interesting that the one person they've used quite a bit so far as an expert, an academic um, Dutch guy called Cas Mud, M-U-D-D-E. Um, he's their expert so far, and he totally agrees with the same basic points that Ban is making. Right. What gave rise to, he's, he'll say the same thing as Ban, that Trump is not a, a, the cause here at all. He's a symptom. Mm -hmm. And he will identify the... Um, Apparently, I didn't know this, but it's now, it became normal at some point, but the 2008 incident, crash, heist, to what extent it was actually just structural and 
agents doing it to people is, is open, but it's, it's gone down as the Great Recession. Yeah, well, it didn't really have much effect. Or did it? Because mm. it maybe is... Maybe. Because the no. solution, the Bannon says the solutions that were done to patch it up it's, it's were a, temporary and they won't it's last. It's temporary. Well, yeah, so it didn't happen at the time. Yeah, so certainly we that's possible. We push it down the road. Right, push it down the road and it's going to come back and bite people. But, I mean, for the, the Guardian, yeah, has this series on populism and they're positing, like you said, they're positing populism as being the opposite of liberalism and leftism, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you said, right? Which is kind of nonsense based on our analysis of what populism is. It's, it's the ordinary people, uh, especially grassroots, ordinary working class people, ordinary people in any society, um, attempting to have more influence on, on the political process. I mean, that's, that's a thing of the left, you know? And like we said, the only way you can spin it into a, the opposite of lefty liberalism and make it a right-wing thing is if you say that, well, it's usually some demagogue that comes along and exploits grassroots or ordinary people's sentiment against the elite. But that's exactly why, I mean, if people could get past their never Trump business, their, you know, the orange man bad stuff, lefties, they would, they should or would be able to realize that, I mean, for 10 or 15 years before Trump, anybody, any lefty worth, worth his salt was criticizing eight years of Bush and eight years of Obama. Right for their warmongering and their their essential elitism, right? And how those people can't realize or can't recognize, at least in essence, that Trump came along as the you know as, as a result of the of that movement of that anti-establishment movement of that anti-corrupt elite, which is traditionally left-wing anti-corrupt elite. Uh, sentiment in America and around the world, you know? I mean, you know, what, 2016, 16, 15 years of the war on terror, 15 years of insecurity, 15 years of misspending of, 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 of you know, war crimes and slaughter and refugees and messing up the world by a, an establishment, you know, particularly in America, but also in Western Europe, in Europe, a Western political elite that lefties railed against supposedly for all that time, well then, in comes Trump, and he is he was voted in as a protest vote by a lot of people against that corrupt elite. So why aren't lefties supporting it? Because Trump. Because of what he looks like, because of what he says, and because of what the media, to a large extent, has programmed people to think about him. To the point that these people who, <laughs> people who should know better cannot accept one word that Trump says, you know, yeah. even, I mean, there was somebody said to me uh, when I said, you know, that it's silly that people just dismiss absolutely everything Trump says because often enough, he's actually right. He's not stupid. He makes sense. He's, his delivery isn't very good, but what he says, uh, now and again at least, is actually accurate, but that doesn't matter. Everything he says is dismissed. And the response from somebody on Facebook when I made that point was, um, well, a broken clock is right twice a day. Which is like, but yeah, but Trump's not a broken clock and it's not, he's not right by accident, it was the implication. Uh -huh. He's right because he's not stupid, but for them he's just this absolute, he, he's, he's, he's worse than the scum of the earth, you know? He okay. deserves no respect whatsoever and it's not possible that he, anything he can say could have any validity whatsoever. That's a fundamentally irrational and moronic approach to take to anything. If you're actually simply interested, if you're not identified, massively over-identified with something at a personal level, if you're just interested in what's going on, you should be able to give credit where credit's due. I didn't like George W. Bush, you know, for my, because of my anti-imperialistic sentiments. But I, w I, I never did, and I would never have picked something he said that I knew was, I, I could easily figure out was actually true and, and criticize it. Because why would I do that? I'm, I'm actually spreading a lie. Just, what, in service to my own personal dislike of Donald Trump because he's orange or because he doesn't look like a proper president or something stupid like that? I mean, yeah. so well, my point is here that the weird thing is is that the saviour for the lefter, lefties came in the form of Donald Trump. What the lefties wanted 
after mm. eight years of Bush and eight years of Obama, for the, what the anti-war camp, let's say, wanted after eight years of Bush and eight years of Obama, because they're two warmongers, came in the, in, the, in the form of President Trump. But unfortunately, it wasn't in the right packaging, essentially. It yeah. didn't look right. Well, they, they were programmed to reject it, um, not just by the, the, all the media attacking Trump when he announced his nomination, but they're programmed by something deeper. I think, I think it's, it's hard to say. How was your finger on it? Um, well, it was a number. If it had been a, I think if it had been a, a well-spoken, a better-spoken, a better-looking. Right, absolutely. With that better, com- all better credentials. Counts it for a matter. lot. Well, I don't know. It I th- does. I think for the average person, it counts for a lot. Look at Obama. Smooth-talking, good-looking, black guy, dances in the Allen Show. That passes for so much. He gets so much of a pass because he could dance well on the Allen Show. That's how, that's how fickle people are. He looks good, therefore he can do whatever the hell he wants. That's a fundamental truth about human nature. I mean, there's loads of studies, if you want to look at, I mean, psychological studies and stuff. You know, good-looking people who are incompetent get jobs far quicker than someone who's skilled, who's ugly. You ha- don't underestimate how fickle human beings are and how a lot of uh, appearance, superficial stuff actually influences their, their behavior and their decisions and what they, what they think about things. Um, I've said this before in articles that Trump is not liked because he's unpresidential. Uh, because he doesn't look right, because he doesn't speak right. And of course, you throw in uh, the tape recording of him at the beginning, uh, even before he became president, where he you know, said that thing about, about women grabbing by the beep and stuff like that. That turned off a lot of kind of like lefty progressives. And it's just a whole package. And then they throw in the, uh, the Russia, he's a Russian spy and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and that's the end of it. But what, what are you, you're saying you don't, you don't think that's the case? Well, no, because the American people voted for Trump. No, we're talking about all the ones that hate him. Ah, yeah, but, but they're a minority. They're a minority. Well, what, um, what kind of minority, though? Well, that's it, I think. But my, 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 my point at the beginning of this was that all of the people that are never Trump, orange man bad, which there's quite a lot of them and they're quite vociferous, and the media has their backing, that that issue is that, and a lot of them are on the left, that the problem for them like I said, Trump was actually an answer to a lot of the things that they wanted, that they'd been campaigning for mm. from a leftist point of view, anti-imperialism. He was the answer, but simply because it came in the wrong package, that's why they hate him. Okay. You know, yeah. that's why they're, they, they, they won't listen to what he says. That's why they won't, uh, no matter what he says, they won't give any credit to him whatsoever because they're extremely fickle. And it's, it's, a, real, it's a real irony, you know, that people are so superficial that something that actually would have at least in part addressed their concerns was, and 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 was act, and essentially was a pop. He's a populist uh, uh, leader. You know, he 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 talks about you know serving the interests of the ordinary people in the world, not, and not ordinary people in America, not just the not just Republicans, but of course, if he's going to serve the working man, if he's going to increase jobs, if he's going to increase uh, employment and and whatever else he says, you know. Put people back to work. That's not just le- that's not just the the Republicans or Republic or conservative voters that are going to benefit from that. It's lefties as well. Mm. Lefties that are suffering. Lefties that are complaining had been complaining about decades under or, or you know sixteen years or whatever under Obama and Bush of their of their um, of, of salaries decreasing and, and and higher taxes and you know um, and and uh, tax money being spent on warmongering and all that kind of stuff. He was an answer to. Uh, not a very good answer, but better than what came before and the best America could expect at this point. He was an answer, a populist answer to the problems of Americans across the board, of the vast majority of Americans. But there was this, this division was deliberately created to stop people recognizing that and the way that it was affected, in part at least, was by highlighting that Trump's ugly, he's not very well spoken, he's a bit sexist. And you know what I mean? So people just went with that focus on the superficial of course, they threw in the Russia. He's a traitor. He's a Russian agent. He's Russian collusion mm-hmm. and stuff, you know. So it's almost like the, I see Trump. What has happened since Trump's Trump's uh, presidency, him becoming the president, and then everything that has happened since has been what was the kind of advent of populism, real populism in terms of a, a populist president coming to power in, in the U.S. and it being subverted by 
the establishment because they don't like populism. They want to stop populism at all costs, which is more say for the people, uh, uh, politicians focusing, focusing more on the will of the people and actually fulfilling the will of the people. Actually, or even, not even if they ask for it, but just listen to them and then do stuff that will make them happy, will increase their, their living standard, will make them feel a bit better. You know, I mean, it's not hard to figure out, you know, where the problems are in a given society and what people are complaining about. So, um, it, something that's always been claimed um, in opposition to these populists and their rising is that we we hold the center because we're the balance of both interests that swing left and right, um, and we take in the broadest consideration, basically all the people's interests. We take as many of them as we can into mind, and that that's why we claim the center ground. What's going on then when? the so-called extremists of left and right are coming to power on the basis of themselves claiming and beginning to enact a, a, the same mix or a similar mix, it seems, of left and right, i.e. it's also center. Because that's why it has appeal, because it appeals to the broadest numbers of people and their interests as possible. So is it two centers is one centre being replaced by a new consensus? Do you see what I'm getting at? No, explain it again. Um, Just say the same thing again, mostly, <laughs> more or less. The, it, was, it, was, it was even called the Washington Neoliberal slash Neocon Consensus. That as internationally between states and also within it. So the, the elites, in, particularly in the, in the West, were all of the same mind. Uh, Tony, As, Tony Blair comes right, to power right. in, in 1997 yeah. and he's it's not Labour it's not the old crazy socialist no, we're a new centre we're a third way where we incorporate uh, the mix of the free market mm -hmm. and et cetera, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, we claim the, the centre ground mm -hmm. and there it is it's unfolding for a couple of decades and then it all just the centre seems to give way but, to people claiming to appeal to the broadest numbers of people i.e. we are the new centre so who's that? But right, well, who is it, or what is it? What's the new center? What's it? What, what, what's it represented by? Well, today? obviously, in Russia, where President Putin, twenty-four years in, um, gets seventy-six percent of the vote that all international observers agree was a free and fair election. That's right. an astonishing amalgamation of both left and right interests into one center. Of course, he's castigated by Western elites as being a far right. Or sometimes far left depends on what day they're talking. Um, I but not normal, not in mm. the center, not where right, things are safe. So populism is the center. <laughs> okay, but then what was it before? Was it not a center? Have we been living in an extremely imbalanced left or right? I'm not sure which. Yeah, because up to this point in time, I mean, we're stuck on definitions here. But the center is something that unites all the people, yeah, as or as much as possible, or appeals to as many people from whatever different sides of the aisle, different sides of the political spectrum as possible, something that, that they can all agree on. And that's obviously, okay, that, they can call that centre. And that would be populism. But by definition, it's populism because you're appealing to a larger number of ordinary people. And it's the ordinary people who have no errors and graces or whatever, uh, including us, for example, who would see that, that that kind of a political policy would, you know, appeals to them, you know, because it, it serves their interests. And that's, that's populism. And it's also nationalism. The, the main focus, the way you appeal to... Uh, the way you get the center, i.e. get as many people in po as possible in a country to agree with you, is to be nationalistic, is to, especially in a world overtaken by globalism, uh, where leaders, in, particularly in Western nations, who are focused on globalism, are focused on, on their, <clears throat> on out, uh, very much focused on outside their own country, you know, and either invading it, bombing it, overthrowing countries for freedom and democracy and all that kind of stuff, and a lot of tax dollars. I mean, you know, what was the number Bannon gave? Seven trillion? Yeah, dollars. I mean, really, did, did, did they get that back? That's seven, seven trillion dollars of American taxpayers' money. Did did they recover that? I mean, did they at least break even? Or were did, was that seven trillion dollars well, taken out of the American economy? Not really. It's taken out of the world economy. Yeah, it's it's global, well, American it's, taxpayer dollars. Uh, ultimately, right, the rest of the world right. system uh, is right, feeds it, right. paying a tithe, <clears throat> uh, yeah. a vassalage to but America. But somebody's well. left without a seat when the music stops, no, eventually. Yeah, well, up to this point, it's been Africa and Asia, right. primarily, right. South America. 
But who knows what else? In it. I don't know what it is, but there's a kind of a malaise in a certain sense that, that, that's been growing uh, against, you know, the general idea of corrupt politicians. I mean, I, I have a palpable sense of that over the past, you know, 15 to 20 years, that more and more people, yeah. obviously you get more access to it because of the, in the age of the internet, you can see more and more people uh, responding in certain ways. But uh, I definitely, over, in the age of, during the age of the internet, I've definitely seen more and more people, I think anyway, uh, expressing anti-establishment yeah. sentiments, being becoming m- more and more distrustful of political leaders, yeah. politicians, and more and more distrustful of the media, I, which is the same authority. They're, they're increasingly distrustful of authority. Now, whether that's because um, some people may actually be feeling it in their pocketbook as a result of bad of mismanagement of, of a country's finances because, let's say, possibly of globalism and rather than focusing on nationalistic uh, policies, they're focusing on elsewhere and they're un- enriching themselves, which is, goes along goes with being a corrupt politician. Or it's uh, it's for some other reason, a, a moral reason or, or something where, where people just, they're not necessarily suffering economically, but they have this uh, um, antipathy towards... Uh, politicians and the establishment and the establishment media because they see it being more and more corrupt. They see more and more lies. That, you know, they, the lies become more transparent and people just say, listen, these people are corrupt. Okay, the economy is still going okay for me, but I still have a problem with, from a moral point of view, I have a problem with, with these leaders. I don't like them. I don't like Tony Blair, for example. Look, at, look what happened to Tony Blair, you know. It didn't take a lot. Well, it did take a lot. He did, he did a lot, obviously, but, I mean, he's... He's probably, if if you could get numbers on that, I'd say there's, you know, 80s, maybe 90% of the British population <laughs> hate Tony yeah. Blair. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's, it can happen very easily, you know what I mean? And, and and they don't hate him because he necessarily, they don't hate him because, you know, he trashed the economy or something like that. Or, 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 uh, he's not only hated by people who lost their jobs because they because of Tony Blair or something like that. They hate him because of what he did, because of the way he acts and what he says and the way he lies. How smart me, you know? So the more people, the more, the more the political sphere becomes populated with people like that, the more you're going to have um, the rise of kind of, for one example, rise of populism, which is, as we've defined earlier on, it's when people no longer... A growing awareness of trust. a distinction between good and bad leadership. Right, and no longer trust their leadership are no longer happy to invest their will in that leadership because that leadership for them is just they're they're immoral. Uh, so we're not doing that anymore. So now we're, we want someone else, you know. So or first of all, it's we have to take back power. We have to do something about this. We have to you know have more say. So we got to get in this. It's like populism is like today in France, I suppose you'd call these yellow jacket protests that have been going on for a couple of weeks. That's probably populism, no? We define this populism. It's certainly the ordinary people trying to assert their will or influence, have a direct influence on the political yeah. processes. So, um, yeah, uh, general, so I suppose there's nothing wrong with populism, except when except, it goes too far. Well, right. What would Jordan Peterson say about this in, his, in the context of his dominance hierarchy and the most intelligent and the most conscientious in general rising to the top and um, not really owing anyone to anyone else, but still choosing to do it because they see it's in the best interest of their own personal interest to serve the greater good in some way. I don't, I don't really think that's the case anymore in Western society, maybe in global society, but certainly not in the West. The best certainly don't, don't rise to the top, you know. Um, the problem is that... He I would mean, say that statistically they do. The higher IQs right, are but, at the top. Yeah, well, yeah, well, higher IQ, does that mean they're better? But the problem is that... He says they do. Yeah, they are. That they, they correlate. Their higher IQ does correlate with higher conscientiousness and... Right, generally speaking. Yeah. Uh, but the problem is that there's a pyramid there, right? Yeah. And the top of the pyramid influences everything below. You've got a hierarchy. You hand down orders, right? So, yeah, you take the top third of the pyramid and say that's the... That's the hierarchy, that's the top tier, the top third, or say that's the ruling class or whatever, or the industrial class. Um, and the vast majority of those people are good people. But if there's someone, if there's a small clique at the top that can exert undue influence on them and on the entire system, then it can go very bad. And it can be, it can be, it can be infected in that way, you know. So well-meaning people can be, can be infected with, a, with a, an increasing 
increasingly corrupt ideology or increasingly corrupt practices and it become can become mainstream. I mean, yeah, uh, I, I, I unfortunately I don't agree with Jordan Peterson on that, and I think it's self evident that that's not not the case. Allowing for what I just said, which is that you can have a a significant number, even a good percentage, a a good majority of um, people at the top, people running the country, let's say, who are well-meaning, who aren't corrupt and evil. But like I said, if there's people above them who have ultimate power, let's say, the final say on what what happens, and who have have a who are self consummately self-interested, then um, that's a problem. You know? Yeah. Arguably the American equivalent of Tony Blair as someone who's just reviled um, consistently and probably by majority, maybe not as much of, is Hillary Clinton. So the Guardian bro- rolled out uh, interview quotes, apparently from interviews they did with her, the former leader of Italy who lost power to the current Salvini, uh, Di Maio coalition, uh, Matteo Renzi and Tony Blair. <laughs> so, uh-huh. they, so they're getting their opinions on what the rise of populism is, means, and what to do about it. You're asking the wrong people. But imagine what kind of mind you have that there you go to. Like, anyway, but what's interesting is that their analysis are, are correct, very good up to a point. So here's Clinton on Brexit. There's no doubt in my mind that Brexit was largely about immigration. Correct. I mean, that's very good. No doubt in my mind either. Uh, Renzi, expanding on that. I think they might have been together when they were asked these. I'm not sure. Anyway, the, the problem is not migration itself, but the fear of migration. Same thing. Same thing. But they don't have the context. Either they don't see it themselves. They probably don't because don't Fenton, of course, Fenton was also in the news this week for saying that Europe needs to, Correct. is an American telling you, what Europeans need to do again. Europe needs to curb immigration. Right. Coming to from stop a, the rise of populism. Coming from a woman who gloated over the murder of Gaddafi and the destruction of his country. Which, As he was actively warning that if you do this to me, you're going to have a wave. Right. So she coming. has the gall. That's the kind of people are dealing with. Think about that. About someone who's so either deceitful or so absolutely clueless as to the results of her own actions. I, I'd say it's more that she's a liar and a and, you know, she wouldn't know the truth or honesty if it came up and bit her on the ass, basically. She's such a stranger to it. Um, but so the disingenuousness of her, uh, the deceitfulness of her to come out and say that, uh, the hypocrisy is just staggering. But there's people like that who just, that's second nature to them. Just, yeah, you know, they can, they can you know, they're the kind of people who go and shoot someone and then go to their funeral and, stand, and give, give a eulogy. Right. I mentioned Steve Bannon earlier and his immediate goal is to get people interested and voting for populist, in quotes, parties in the European elections in May next year. That's that's what he says. He's going around campaigning and speaking to leaders of movements and parties in Europe about. Uh, this week, um, I, want, I think people need to see this. I'm going to Ask Scott to put this up. The European Parliament itself um, began political campaigning, not for any one particular leader or ideology or party, um, but rather just to get people out to vote, period. It, it reminds me actually of um, the message of the Democrats and the, and the left in the United States during the midterm elections. There wasn't someone saying, we need to stop Trump. The, the powerful message they were hitting and they were getting celebrities to do it too was just get out and vote. Dot, dot, dot. That wasn't fleshed out, but you, you need to get out and vote. Um, the, the European Parliament is taking the same tack. Can you, can you pull that up? Yeah. <clears throat> Hang on a second. Uh, okay, maybe not. Firefox no. is not cooperating. Okay. One second. Um, I want you to look at the poster. That's already up on some streets in cities across Europe <clears throat> and what they're, I don't know. Mm, I, don't, there it is. I don't know exactly what they're supposed to be saying, but maybe we can figure it out between us. Um, 
Voilà. Thanks, Scotty. Uh, European election 2019, Strasbourg uses Donald Trump to motivate voters. Now, the text in French just simply says, this time I'm registering to vote. I'm registering and I'm going to vote. So that's all the message is at the level of system one or system two. But that image is going to now be in cities across Europe and on TV and Euro News and as much as they can, they're going to push that image on, on the right, you see there. What in the hell are they trying to say? The European there? Union is doing that? Yes. So the, the Trump's behind the star there with the European flag or symbol of the European flag on his face. <laughs> Does that mean, that means never Trump? Yes, that comes to mind, never Trump. Um, stop Trump. Get, get out and vote to stop a Trump, to stop an equivalent Trump. Yeah. To stop, stop populism um, in Europe. Yeah, the EU is a very much anti-populist because populism equals nationalism, equals, you know, potentially the destruction of the European Union. Or a cessation of... It's integration, uh, uh, well, the end a of halting the, of it, yeah, or the, an ending of it. Yeah, yeah. the ending of, of, of the project, of the European Union project. So, um, yeah. What was your point about that? Just that it's, well, it's just, an issue. Just that, just that that's, well, whatever, what is it they're trying to communicate there? Um, yeah. I think you, you summed it up there. It's uh, anti-populism, so don't, don't, um, because what has been happening, of course, um, repeatedly, is that, the so-called far-right or populist parties um, of the individual member states in Europe, they've been registering candidates for the European parliamentary elections every four or five years whenever it takes place, and they've been doing really well. It's the one venue where they do, actually, it's the venue where they do well at all. The UK Independence Party, Nigel Farage, mm -hmm. got his um, fame and his his position because of his success in parliamentary elections. The UKIP was the leading, it won the most seats, it got the most share of the British vote in the European parliamentary elections the last time around. Mm -hmm. um, Le Pen as well, I think, when it was Front National, also the leading French party represented in the all Europe parliament. Um, I think they're worried that it's going to be a kind of a clean sweep where a majority... They, as soon as they get into the European Parliament, they join factions. So the ones who are all the populists, say nationalist right, are kind of all seated together and they are the faction. They come under a subheading, a kind of a European group mm -hmm. party. So they're worried that this particular faction will become the dominant, I suppose the majority, maybe a clear majority inside the European Parliament, which mm -hmm. by definition there is, is a contradiction that they will have to deal with in some way because the body that's supposed to it's really only, it doesn't have much power, but it does rubber stamp, and I think it can propose now some legislation at EU level, but this body that's supposed to rubber stamp whatever the European Commission comes up with and whatever the ministers agree on when they meet for European summits and the prime ministers and so on, is going to be fundamentally antagonistic to it. It's like having, it would be, it would be like having um, a House and Senate in the United States that are like completely at odds with each other I mean, that, such that one house, say, say, imagine it was majority Democrat. Well, mm. it is. But imagine that a majority Democrat and it wanted to break up the United States mm. into mm. individual states as nation states. Mm. While the other house is, obviously, it, it's fundamentally the other way. It wants to maintain the union. Well, the next step, it's only a few steps. You can see where you go to a serious crisis from there. It's happened once before in the United States, obviously, with the Civil War. Mm. So... That's a kind of, I'm not suggesting civil war is on the horizon in Europe, but it, that's the level of the standoff. And it's, it's kind of represented in that formal advertising strategy, that tack they're taking. This is the neutral, um, claiming the center, civilized, above it all, you know, we, we don't get down into the fray of the dirty. And we certainly, are, we're civil and we're certainly not, doing mm. anti-Semitic campaigns like that, Orban, mm. uh, et cetera, et cetera, constantly criticizing the tactics taken by mm. their opponents. And they just put Trump's face as the key of their campaign and then they stick a European yeah. flag over like it, like rub it in your face, you know? Yeah. But it's, it's, I think it's going to backfire in so many ways. And, 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 but, I think but, they fundamentally underestimate they're Trump's popularity 
and the level of in himself and also then his the equivalent the the sets of deplorables they shunt into the same bracket as Trump across Europe yeah they're und- and they're underestimating the level of populism and, and support for popular leaders and for nationalism in European countries and uh, in Europe in general they're The under- Guardian says that, that. The one in four people they did some kind of meta-analysis right. of recent elections across Europe yeah. national and first of all I wouldn't trust the results they of elections they one in four I wouldn't right. trust the re- <coughs> results but of elections still high think, yeah but I, I think it's probably twice that or right. more. <clears throat> I think even a majority of people in, in Europe would, when asked, when, when asked the question in, in a simple way, uh, or asked several questions, quite simple questions that could easily determine whether or not they were kind of like for lefty, liberal, kind of globalist values or for nationalistic values, the vast majority of people, or a good majority of people, would would turn out as, as, as nationalists, you know. Mm-hmm. And there's something else going on here, I think, and it's a bit, you know, abstract, but in a general sense, I don't think anybody would deny that the level of insecurity or a sense of insecurity has been spreading over, particularly over the Western world, but probably over the whole world. Uh, and we keep on going back to 9-11, kind of since around the time of 9-11, over the past 17, 18, 19 years, um, the level of insecurity and, and anxiety, let's say, generalized sense that among the people that something isn't right, that things are, aren't going the right way, that, you know, things are very chaotic and, and, and that's manifested by this infighting and, you know, fractious uh, kind of social discourse and stuff that we see. And of course, there's the hard nuts and bolts aspects of, of, of insecurity and chaos in countries. We have these terror attacks being carried out in European and US soil and school shootings and all of, all of that. All of that stuff encourages a sense of uh, insecurity and anxiety among the vast majority of people who are sentient and the natural response to that sense, a sense of insecurity in society that goes way back to kind of like tribal times and is in our DNA is that people close ranks into their identifiable kind of in-group. You know, they, they, they shut the door, they circle the wagons. Things aren't right, things are nervous, there's danger on the horizon and people may be perceiving other dangers. I mean, you throw in the weather and the general kind of climate chaos that... Uh, has been going on crazy weather happening to people or happening to, in, in different countries killing a lot of people uh, things are very unsettled and that lends itself to populist sentiment i.e. nationalist sentiment i.e. close the doors around our little country around our ethnic or whatever in-group social in-group and uh, to hunker down because bad things are coming Bad things are happening and, and probably worse is coming. And that's a general, vague, maybe unconscious, mostly unconscious sentiment that a lot of people have. And it's been engendered, it's been created, that real, sen- that real chaos and real insecurity uh, and real, real unst- uh, instability in society has been caused by corrupt and irresponsible leadership. So the natural result is, yeah, screw the leaders, get them out of there. Get them out of there. And, and they're not satisfied with a repackaging of the same kind of leadership under slightly different. No, they're wise they're, to they're that. They're wise, to, and they, they they they've seen it before. They know it needs to be fundamental. Although, what exactly? What it? Um, most of the time, it's right wing, but not always. I mean, no. obviously, the UK comes to mind. Corbyn, although it's not quite, you know, it's not clear that he's got most of the voting public behind him. But there are other cases too. Obviously, in Mexico, that's a leftist leader. But but it's there's, right. there's there can be lefty nationalism. Right, you know, what I mean, you can have leftists who are or centrist, actual centrists, or maybe mostly leftists who are very much nationalists. Oh yeah, I mean, but look at Chavez. Chavez. I mean, he was super. Uh, you know, according to everybody, he's super socialist, um, but he was absolutely one hundred percent nationalist. Yeah. I mean, his he was like nationalization, nationalism, nationalization of of the of major industries, right? So you can uh, keep the keep the money in the country for the people. That's nationalism, and it's also populism. But in that case, it's left wing. So this whole left right business is just thrown in there, just deliberately to try and divide people from something from the the common ground that they all and inha- uh, that they most people inhabit, which is that at this point, certainly in history, they're all on the same page in terms of we need to look after our own interests. Who doesn't need to? Who doesn't think that they need to look after their own interests? Who doesn't think that it's natural to say, well, we've got to get our own house in order, you know? If there's something wrong with my house, you know, physically, structurally, if there's something wrong with my house, 
I'm going to do that first before I go and help my neighbour to fix his house, you know. Especially as we're repeatedly getting and increasingly more floods and they're more extreme. Right, yeah. Water keeps coming in. I'm sorry, but I need to fix right. this thing right. first. And it's being demonised. And, and so someone doesn't want that to happen. Some A certain group, elite group, establishment in, in Western nations really, really don't like that. Because why? Because it posits, I suppose, a reduction in their own power and their own influence. Because they want to group as many people as possible under their influence, as they, you know, um, and and this kind of um, atomization of, of of other formerly kind of cohesive blocks like the EU, the the breaking up of the EU is, yeah, people in the the bureaucrats, high level bureaucrats in the EU are probably quite happy with the idea that they have this control over so many countries. You know, they get to influence and have, you know, most of the control over. Uh, over many of the policies that occur in, what, 28 different European countries? And if you suggest to them, hey, why don't you take a cut in a bunch of your countries? In fact, maybe you should lose your job altogether because if the European Union breaks up, you EU bureaucrats won't have a job anymore. There will be no 28 countries for you to exert your influence over. And those people would say, yeah, I'm not don't think I'm going to let you do that, you know. Or I'm going to try and stop you doing that, you know. So, yeah. Steve Bannon is, is unequivocal in his identification of the source of the problem. If, if it's to be geographically located, he says it's Brussels. The centre of the globalist project oh, yeah? is Brussels. Um, and, and that would explain his motivation to see it torn down or at least he said. He says. Um, he said in his recent Oxford debate that um, you know I don't want to tear anything down. I don't want to destroy anything. We're not anarchists, for God's sake. And he says also that when he goes to meet Le Pen, Salvini, Orban, they are also not interested in tearing down any good work that's been done so far. Mm-hmm. Um, they just want to. But I suppose without using the term, they're all talking about regime change. So it's in it, Brussels. It's a we- yeah. On the one hand, they attack it as a globalist project, globalist, globalism central, I suppose, the primary project of the groups that meet in places like Davos and Bilderberg every year. The European Union is their core project, their chief vehicle through which to administer and push and promote mm-hmm. globalism, in quotes. But at the same time, it's not like let's tear it all down because there are, of course, some fundamental fundamentally useful and positive aspects to it that could be used or that are even effective. Like on the the, the first one, the one that the, the British are having to debate now in hindsight and um, kind of gnashing their teeth over is that the simple one that you've raised a couple of times. Um, economically, there's... It's very hard to divest yourself. You cannot, you can't divest yourself because it's so damn attractive <clears throat> to have one essential <clears throat> free trade zone. Mm-hmm. That really does, even if it's mismanaged, mm-hmm. even if it's the, overweening, it's, it's not distributed correctly or appropriately, even if there are some losers, a lot have gained. The there problem. is enough trickle down yeah. in all the mismanagement that they've done that Europe as a whole has benefited from being one trade block. Yeah, except they would say that it's overweening in terms of it's it's one thing. It's not it's not just about economics. You know, it's, yeah. just, it's not just a free trade agreement. I mean, the USA and Canada or USA and wherever, Europe, European Union and, and other countries have tr- free trade agreements. But those other countries don't get to dictate, uh, po- you know, um, uh, justice system, uh, laws or policies or uh, immigration policies or laws uh, in, in those countries. I mean, that's not part of a free trade agreement. It's like, Free trade agreement is just should just be about free trade, and that's I think what a lot of people, a lot of the like uh, exiteers, you know, people mm-hmm. who push for leaving the EU or changing this the, the fundamental nature of the EU would want. They say, listen, it can be an economic kind of a free trade zone, but there's far too much influence from Brussels, from central powers in Brussels, on many other aspects of of life in those countries that. <clears throat> That is, uh, just shouldn't be there. It's unnecessary. Why, why would you have that, you know? Yeah. Um, 
the yeah. the battle between the EU and Poland is interesting. Um, they formally sanctioned Poland. I don't think anything's gone into effect. I think the idea is that they would they will withhold budget redistribution to Poland um, as part of those sanctions. But it's formally been sanctioned, and the argument that they're having is that the new Polish government in 2015 um, infringed some basic rules that are, I think, explicitly enshrined in the Lisbon Treaty, so the kind of informal constitution of the whole European Union, mm -hmm. namely by it's the, the people they selected, the incoming government, and appointed to positions in the judiciary. And that's that's the basic gist of it, that you, mm -hmm. you, they're saying, no, 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 we're a rules-based society, and you've infringed here, here, and here. They gave examples. And, and remember, the separation of the three executive branches are a fundamental thing we all agree on, the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature. Mm -hmm. And you're going, okay, well, that's, yeah, if, if they've been doing that, well, yeah, that's a transgression. But here's the thing. The previous government, which was actually of Donald Tusk's party, who's Donald Tusk is now the unappointed president of the European Commission, uh, unelected. His party, when he was prime minister of Poland, did exactly the Campaigned same thing. Because that's exactly what everyone does. Donald Trump, that's right. part of the, the war, the political war against Trump at the moment is was initially to try and delay as much as possible his appointments for not just uh, to of justices uh, supreme court and other and other courts but also his appointments in in his rightful territory in, in at the head of agencies mm -hmm. uh, that would answer to the executive, the executive branch. they're holding him off left right and center and they give all these reasons for why but there's the fundamental transgression he's supposed to have made is is a, is a bluff because everyone does that when they come in. That's what you do. Mm -hmm. the, the the new Polish government was doing exactly as Tusk's before. It's common practice, mm -hmm. but suddenly but the thing that they hold, the thing that they say, the rules that we all fundamental rules we all follow by are suddenly applied for specific incoming governments, mm -hmm. and that, that's what interests me. Why is it that now you're upholding the rule of law and the rules based order? when you know full well that the actual practice of politics to this point has been done by horse trading and bartering and mm. bribery. Of course it is. Mm. That, that's how the system works. We all say we're following these rules. Yeah. Well, Tusk obviously joined, the, joined a different, different group when he, when he left. Right. Uh, so obviously there's, there's, a, politics there's, and went the there's a personal investment because he's of the other side in an intra-Polish affair. Right. But there's more to it than that. How do you get the machinery of the European Union who target you like that? I, th there's some transgression, I think, that's not being spoken well, it's of. Populist, no? Populist, but what does that mean? Because the government is is following the rules. As well, look, when you're a part of the EU, if you're a member state in the EU, you've signed up to the principles on which the EU is is based, and the, the spoken, the written and unwritten principle, which is that this is one big group of countries, one big super state, and the power of Brussels is kind of ultimately the ultimate power and you agree by joining the EU to abide by the, 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 the spirit or the essence of the EU which is we're all one big happy family no borders free movement of people free trade kind of like it's one big country anybody who comes out and shows any inclination of saying you know I kind of prefer kind of nationalism you know kind of closed borders ish and um, you know not really being part of the EU, but focusing more on Poland first, let's say, as opposed to the EU first, that's a big no-no. Like, you're, you're going to draw serious, serious fire down on your head by, by you know, so, uh, you, can, you, can, you can talk that way, but as soon as you start implementing policies or making moves to make it a reality, they're going to come down on you because you're not, you're, not, you're not a member of the club anymore. You're not playing by the rules of the club anymore, you know? Your, your membership might be revoked. Well, of course, they don't want to revoke your membership. That's one of the ironies of the EU is that they can't just kick people out because that would could start a, a, a domino effect of other people. They, they might be shooting themselves in the foot by just saying, okay, you don't want to abide by our rules anymore? Get out. No, they don't want to do that because the whole thing could fall apart. So instead, what they do is they uh, they punish, give you a good beating uh, to bring you back into line. 
So you're not allowed to be populist, nationalist, pop, to the extent that populism and nationalism is, are synonymous. You're not allowed to be that in the EU. That's not what the EU is. The EU is a big, a big communist super state, like. Communist. Yeah, we're all together. We're all in a big commune. We all live together in a big commune and you have to, everybody has to eat the lentils, like. <laughs> you know, you have to eat the lentils and the, and whatever else commune people eat. Um, but uh, yeah, just a word on Brexit. Uh, formality of the uh, signing of the document today. So May's all happy. Well, she shouldn't be happy. She's not actually happy. They just went through the formality of signing her Brexit agreement so that the UK is going to effectively leave the EU, but not really. Um, most of the EU will remain the same. Uh, based on the current disagreement, uh, the, the UK membership in the EU won't, won't change. They won't really leave, and, and their, their relationship with the EU won't change very much, especially since it more or less has this idea of a backstop or a prevention of there ever being a hard border um, between the uh, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, no hard border there, which means that effectively... Um, Northern Ireland remains within the European Union, which means that the rest of the UK remains within the European Union. Because that would just be a, a, an unworkable situation. We have one part of a country who's, that's in the EU and the rest of it isn't. That's, there's no way that's going to happen, but that's on paper, basically. So May's, May's deal is just a stop. And people who are complaining about it are right to complain about it because it's to the extent that, there was any, that, that it was a legitimate thing to do anyway to, to try and have a Brexit. Um, uh, th their complaints uh, are legitimate that it's not Brexit at all. But then you have to recognise the fact that Brexit was never really possible and was never going to happen and there was no political will for Brexit at all. And they've spent the past two years trying to trying to undo that vote effectively or, or, or manipulate or fool the population into come up with some kind of agreement that looks like Brexit, that's enough to fool the population, throw them a few a few concessions and we'll just stay in the EU and hopefully this will all be over in the morning and we'll forget about it. Hopefully mm -hmm. by next year it'll all be done. That's what they've been trying to do for the past few years. And, but now it's become more about internal political party politics and you have a group of uh, coup plotters essentially who are planning to, when May takes this agreement to Parliament that has to uh, approve it, that looks like at this point that, there are sh that it'll be rejected by a, ma a majority of people. Uh, on both sides, Labour and uh, from all parties will yeah. reject it, including May's own party. A lot of mutineers uh, will reject it. And when that happens, she'll be booted. Um, and then there'll be... When's that coming up? Soon? December. Early, okay. early December. <clears throat> yeah. In a week or two. And uh, so right now there's a battle going on with May's government uh, trying to strategize. They have their war room going and stuff, planning how they're going to convince enough, as many po MPs as possible, to vote for it, to, change, to change their minds, including offering people peers, uh, or sorry, peerages, yeah. i.e. lifetime peerages in the House of Lords where they get to lie there and drool on their, on their shirts, you know, uh, and get paid, you know, large amounts of money for doing so. Um, Do they wear the wigs? Job. Uh, and Will they get a wig? I don't think you're... Uh, some people can wear a, a wig in, a, in the House of Lords, but uh, most of them have wigs anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, so that's what she's doing. She's apparently offering peerages to people to try and convince them to to vote for her. Um, but it doesn't look like it what, probably won't happen anyway. And then she'll be done, basically. What was this about organising a, a financial crash? Yeah, apparently that was one of, one of the one of the things was that they were going to manufacture in some way or other, uh, a, you know, the appearance of a crash or maybe just you know scaremonger. I don't know how they were going to do it. But obviously, that you're talking about the the Chancellor of the Exchequer you know, pe pe and, and maybe the, the head of the Bank of England and stuff. There's probably different people there who you could get in contact with to put out, you know, notices or whatever that... The, the, the There's been a run on the pound and the banks are drying up or something. Yeah, because that, that in the event that Parliament rejects her deal, suddenly they're just, you know, it'll be scaremongering, a controlled scaremongering, if you know what I mean, of, uh, of the markets and, and, and that the economy's on the verge of collapse because you all voted against my deal. Now, do you want to vote again and think hard about it this time? That was apparently part of their plan, you know, so they're really desperate just to... And these are just people who want to stay in power. This is May who wants to remain Prime Minister. 
and her ministers who want to remain ministers. That's all they're doing this for. And the ones who want to boot her out have no interest in Brexit either. Really. They just, they're just vying for political power. Assuming that the financial crash thing won't happen because it's been leaked. I mean, yeah. that might have been why it was done to sabotage it anyway. But assuming that, that the next sequence is, okay, the, the Brexit deal, in quotes Brexit, goes to Parliament, they vote on it, the DUP have already declared they would not support it. Right. So right there, that's the majority. Even if all of right. the Tory party Both got behind me, they, they won't anyway. So it's not going to pass. Then there's a leadership challenge. She's probably booted. There's a new leader of the Conservative Party Boris who Johnson. becomes an interim prime minister Boris Johnson, until the next it. elections. Yeah. So Boris Johnson. <laughs> and then he'll lead the Brexit, the new Brexit. He'll, he'll make a new tremendous deal, an even better tremendous deal with the EU. He'll hard, he, he'll, He'll drive a hard bargain, basically, you know. With Trump's help. With his floppy head, with Trump's help, help, and he'll get an even better deal. And it'll just be another shop as well, and ultimately, you know, it'll, the whole thing so is there'll be, it's yeah. a joke. It might probably lead to new elections. Or that's the other possibility, which is the, which the Labour Party and Jeremy Corbyn are very uh, interested in happening, which is more so than, a, than May being booted or anything like that. They want the situation to provoke a, a call for a general election. Okay, let's follow that on. Corbyn becomes Prime Minister. Mm. What happens next? Uh, he probably uh, has another referendum. Maybe. Maybe not. Um, depending on what the situation is at that point in time, if people have had enough of it, if they get a, if they get a sense that maybe people have swung back to keep staying in the EU. But if not, I think Corbyn would just end up in exactly the same position because I think every leader, who, no matter who comes to power in the, in the UK, realises that uh, probably there's still a majority of people who would vote for Brexit and want Brexit. So they have to deliver Brexit of some description. Uh, so he would then make his attempt to fob off some Brexit dodgy, light. we're Brexiting, quote unquote, on the people and hopefully they would they would bite it. You know, Eventually people would just maybe just get bored of the whole thing and say, okay, just give me the damn agreement, I'll sign it. Yeah. Just shut up about Brexit now, you know. Really, it's insignificant, you know. I mean, people ascribe all sorts of things to Brexit, like, you know, especially the Little Englanders and stuff, you know, bringing, you know, independence for the UK and this is this this is England's or the UK's, you know, especially on the on the right wing, like Paul Joseph Watson and stuff. It's like, this is the UK taking back in sovereignty, making England great again, you know, striking a blow against the globalists and stuff. And they think that's what's going to happen as a result of if they can get a real Brexit type thing. Uh, but that's just nonsense, you know. Um, because that's not how it works. You know, the people in power in the UK are of the same mindset as the people in power in the EU, essentially, you know what I mean? You're talking about, quote-unquote, globalists there, you know, who are fundamentally corrupt leaders, kind of probably psychos, psychopaths of some description, and unfortunately they just never have, ultimately this comes down to whether or not leaders have the interests of the ordinary people at heart or not. And unfortunately, in this day and age in the Western world, most of the leaders who have all of the real power and the significant power do not have the best interests of the people at heart. And that's why people aren't happy. Yeah. I think we better wrap it up there, folks. Uh, we're kind of running, running past time. Um, yeah, that was populism explained, more or less, um, among other things. We hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, if you liked it, please like, and if you like our channel, please subscribe so you can get notified about new videos. Um, we'll be back next week with another show on another topic. So until then, have a good evening. See you next week. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.